if you get your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see Decide what you believe. We all watched in horror 911. The planes hit the towers and the towers came down. Did you ever wonder how they fell so fast? Well, maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask. Don't you think it's strange? There were no fighter jets. Did someone give the order not to intercept? And if they really scramble, then why'd they fly so slow? Maybe there's an answer that we don't want to know. And where was our president? George W. That fool. He was visiting with children at an elementary school. And when he heard the news, he didn't seem concerned. He just calmly read a picture book while all those people burned. and Bin Laden's Now what's that all about? While all of us were grounded they flew his family out Osama got his training from the CIA Our soldiers took Afghanistan they let him slip away A new Pearl Harbor was their big chance to launch two wars that they'd planned in advance. Now we know they lied about weapons in Iraq. Did they allow the 9-11 attack? your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe Howdy, I'm Bill Olson, and welcome to another episode of 9-11 Was an Inside Job, the June 23rd episode, 2012. Well, today we're going to devote the entire episode to Sibel Edmonds. Now, remember, I played a, a, oh, about half of an interview last time, or time before last, with uh, uh, Alex Jones. The He had a 45-minute interview with her, and I played a almost half of it. In the meantime, I got this book. Her book is The Classified Woman. Go ahead and switch to camera four and we'll give it a close-up. Yeah, I have to aim it right. <laughs> there we go. 
And uh, anyway, I recommend that you get that, you know, go out and buy your own copy. It is really exciting reading for, you know, for a book that you expected to be kind of dry and just filled with facts. She's a really good writer. And I was going to, uh, you see behind me is the beginning of a movie. It's called uh, Kill the Messenger. Now, that's a chapter in her book here, Kill the Messenger. They're shooting the messenger, I guess is what they have, shooting the messenger. But uh, I was going to read the an excerpt from this on on the air. Uh, but you've been spared because the excerpt that I was going to read, it was, it was where she got fired and what her boss said to her. I mean, he called her a whore and everything else. But one of the things that he said to her when he got her in the elevator while they were escorting her out of the building... Uh, is right there on this film almost right after we start it. So we're going to go ahead and start it now. And this this is most of the show, but this is really worth watching. And like I said, I recommend you get this book. So let, let's go for it here. Uh, if I can. There we go. Okay, go ahead and take me out of here. Sibel Edmonds, born to a Turkish family in Iran, spent six months as a translator for the FBI. It put her at the heart of a major intelligence scandal. In June 2002, the scandal broke in the Washington Post. Sibel and a colleague, John Cole, alleged that spies had infiltrated the FBI language services section. It all started the previous year. One morning in September 2001. plan to be a language specialist. This was not what I was planning. Four days after September 11, I got this phone call and they said they really needed my services and they had completed the background check and when I could, uh, when could, I, when could I start? There were all these documents, there were all these audio tapes that needed to be translated. There were all these people who had been detained and they needed to interrogate them and most of these people didn't speak English. Our first effort is to identify any associates related to the hijackers. Victory will come over time. He's responded acts. immediately. More than and, those and at that point, the chaos of that time period with September 11, and, you know, it was, how could you say no? When I got there, I had no idea what exactly I was going to do for them. See, this department, this language division in the FBI, is considered the highest security unit in the FBI. Sibel Edmonds lived in Istanbul and Tehran to the age of 18. She speaks Turkish, Farsi, and Azeri. The FBI recruited her to translate wiretaps in Turkish that it had recorded inside the United States. The targets were suspected of espionage or of having links with terrorist organizations. By December 2001, Sibel had been working at the FBI for two months. 
Then, one Sunday morning, she and her husband Matthew got a call that would turn their lives upside down. Sibel had been working for the FBI about two months after the 9-11 uh, occurrence. And one Sunday morning, um, we received a call. One of the other translators in the department where she worked in the FBI called up and said uh, that she would like to come over and introduce her husband to us. Uh, we had never met her husband. My wife, of course, had met uh, the other translator. Uh, her name is Malik Jan Dickerson. Her husband's name was Douglas Dickerson. I was seated here. Sabelle was seated beside me. Uh, Malik Dickerson was seated in this chair here, and Douglas Dickerson was seated over here. The husband did most of the talking, and he started out right away giving a background telling us who he was. He had worked for the Air Force, both in Turkey and in some of the Central Asian republics. He described how they had met in Turkey, the fact that he had been in Turkey, the fact that uh, he was in the arms procurement business. He worked for the government. Liaison with various uh, countries in, in the region, doing weapons procurement. But fairly rapidly, he started to describe uh, the fact that he had friends in the Turkish community. Uh, he wanted to know whether or not we knew about some of the Turkish organizations. And I said that, well, I thought you need to have some sort of business uh, relationship with Turkey or a reason to be a member of that organization. Uh, he at that point said, you, Sabelle, all you have to do is tell them who you are and what you do and you can be a member of that organization, and then you can retire with a very good life. Sibel realized she had been approached by spies who had penetrated the FBI language services section. And then we escorted them to the door and wished them good day. I didn't know at the time, had no idea that what had just taken place was going to have such a dramatic effect on our lives and had such a devastating effect on Sibel. How had Melik Dickerson infiltrated the language services section? And what was this mysterious organization the Dickersons were involved with? Initially, I reported all the stuff to my supervisor in December 2001, and nothing happened. And actually, I was told to just hush it and, and not talk about it. So I reported to somebody in the mid-management, and then this retaliation started. You know, They were taking away my job assignments, and I would go on my computer, and I had real urgent documents that were requested by certain agents from certain field offices, and I couldn't bring them up on my computer. My computer was confiscated, uh, and the attitude toward me in that department by, by a supervisor that I was working uh, for. So I, I said, well, this is time for me to take it to the highest level, to the headquarter and to Director Muller and his assistant, and I did that. And that even backfired more. For Robert Muller, the director of the FBI, Sibel had become an embarrassment. The reprisals intensified. Sibel was taken to a building in Chinatown for a lie detector test. Oh, they asked me like things about security, whether or not I was approached by, by, you know, spies and to be recruited, which I said yes. While Sibel's colleague, Melik Dickerson, was assigned to translate the Turkish wiretaps, some of which targeted her mysterious friends, Sibel's work came to an abrupt end. Uh, it was March 22nd, Friday, about 4.20 p.m. Sibel's allegations had made too many waves. The person in charge of security division, a Sukum broker, said, well, I would like you to hand me your key to your, to your cabinets and your badge. And I said, well, may I ask why? Based on what reason are you firing me? And this guy, Friel, said, you know why you're being fired? You're being fired because you reported these issues and you reported them to the headquarter and we don't have to give you a darn reason why you're being fired. And at this point he got up and he's like, now you're going to be escorted outside the building. At this point, three of them, they are escorting me downstairs. And on the way down, 
Thomas Friel told me, he said, we will be watching you, we will be listening to you, you cannot talk about any of these issues that he reported outside, you cannot, you don't even have a right to go to any attorney. Sibel was out of the FBI. But now everyone in the language division was talking about the Dickersons. The time had come for them to disappear. Douglas and Melick Dickerson flew to Europe, never to return. Disowned by the FBI, Sibel decided to turn to Congress. She arranged a meeting with Senators Patrick Leahy and Charles Grassley. They started talking about whistleblower protection and how I would be covered. And I said, just wait a minute. I am not a whistleblower. I'm not blowing the whistle. And they said, no, you are a whistleblower. And I said, no, I'm not a whistleblower. It took me months and months until I just kind of resigned. I said, fine, I'm a whistleblower. Sibel didn't stop there. She filed two claims, one for unfair dismissal and the other for breach of freedom of speech. The Department of Justice had no choice but to start an internal inquiry. Months went by. Seeing that the inquiry was leading nowhere and that Congress had failed to act, Sibel turned to the media. We had wiretaps that were translated. Where do you think the truth lies? And that's what the American people need to learn about. I'm talking about those those people who make decisions not to act on certain translations, certain intelligence pieces before 9-11 and after 9-11. They haven't mentioned anybody who actually is connected to Al-Qaeda in mid or higher level. And it's just Kafkaesque. Sibel had gone too far for her former bosses. The FBI director handed the case over to the then Attorney General, John Ashcroft. Ashcroft's reaction was extreme. On October 18, 2002, my 10th uh, wedding anniversary, I was informed that the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, had invoked this rarely invoked privilege called the state secret privilege. Based on this privilege, everything that had to do with my case was considered top secret, classified, and a matter of national security, which requested the courts to put a stop in any process that dealt with my case, whether or not I was right or, or not. State secrets privilege is an all-powerful political and legal weapon dating from the 1950s. In the wake of 9-11, it was a favorite of the Bush administration. Muller and Ashcroft managed to block Sibel's lawsuits. The message was clear. Keep quiet or go to jail. Gagged in the name of national security, Sibel said no more for two years. like this awful awful time so I came to this point that nothing was going to happen and during this time uh, they had established just finished establishing the 9-11 Commission we must uncover every detail and learn every lesson of September the 11th keen to unite the country at a time of conflict the Bush administration agreed to a congressional commission of inquiry into September 11th its mandate included investigating shortcomings in U.S. intelligence agencies that had made the attacks possible. This is the only hope we have. This 9-11 Commission report, they're going to say what's wrong. For example, with the FBI translation units, which a lot of things are wrong. Behind closed doors, Sibel gave the Commission her testimony, once again revealing all she knew. And the White House had just made its first mistake. Condoleezza Rice had just come out and made the statement saying, I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane 
and slam it into the World Trade Center. To say that we had no specific information, that was an outrageous lie. And she's a national security advisor there. And all those people, they report to her, say we didn't have it. So when we came out of one of the 9-11 commission hearings, um, 9-11 family members, they just pointed at me and they said, you know, she's one of those people who was outraged with the recent statement by Condoleezza Rice. And suddenly all those cameras started flashing on my face. It's like, well, what do you think of this statement? And I said, well, that was an outrageous lie. And then for the first time, that made all the headlines. Simple Edmonds, can you repeat again the information that you have to substantiate? And I gave an explanation. I said, she said we. We includes National Security Advisor, includes the FBI, the CIA, the NSA. That's what we means. And she said we. Sibel's comments sowed the seeds of doubt in a nation yearning for truth. Condoleezza Rice was forced to backtrack on what she had said. As I said to you in the private session, I probably should have said I could have not imagined because within two days, people started to come to me and say, oh, but there were uh, these reports in 1998 and 1999. So that uh, was the, the start of me outside doing it outwardly, doing it more publicly and doing it more visibly. On the 24th of July, 2004, the 9-11 Commission released its report. America looked to it for the truth. But not one of the report's 567 pages made any reference to Sibel's claims. Good morning. My name is Laurie Van Auken. On the morning of September 11th, my husband Kenneth was killed while at his office on the 105th floor of the North Tower at the World Trade Center. The 9-11 Commission's report is supposed to provide the definitive account of what had transpired on September 11, 2001. We hope that our thousands of unanswered questions would be addressed and answered. Yet incredibly, we have found that the Commission's definitive final report has actually yielded more questions than answers. That was like, oh, is this what they've been waiting for? was going to put all the stuff and say what's wrong with the system and have individual accountability. None of those. I want to know. I want to know. Who the whistle blows, blows for you. What we got truly insulted the intelligence of the American people. Get off the couch. Violated our loved one's memories. Raise up your hand. And might end up hurting us one day soon. Take a I locked myself in this room for three days and started reading everything line by line. Don't tell me that's just the way that it goes. I was outraged. I need to know what simple Edmonds know. So do you. National security whistleblowers tried to testify before the commission, but were either not asked to testify or their testimony was only barely acknowledged or worse yet, completely omitted from the record. Take off the gag. They complimented everybody. Take off the gag. Don't let them hide behind their flag. So politicians were very happy about it. Get off the couch. Raise up your hands. It's a war word. It's time to make a stand. One whistleblower that we made sure the commission met with was FBI translator Sibel Edmonds. It's just the way that it goes. Sibel is here. I need to know what Sibel Edmonds knows. So you know. This is just the biggest whitewash, and this is not what they promised they were going to give the American public. There were three holes that I could see in this uh, work of fiction. Um, testimony from people like Sybil Edmonds, uh, the preparedness of our nation and the crime scene that was 9-11 was certainly not addressed as a crime scene. Very disturbing, very disturbing. I mean, you know that when they're supposed to be doing this report on these agencies, 
and they put it out, and the first reaction of the agency is complimenting it, you know something is really wrong. Sibel's name was now sung in New York clubs. She had become the most famous of all the 9-11 whistleblowers. Thousands of people signed petitions in her support. The former translator became the toast of anti-establishment blogs. Supported by the Vietnam-era whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg, Sibel called upon disaffected intelligence agents to join her. Around a hundred soon did so. Many of them had been tracking Islamist terrorists before September 11th, but had since been reassigned to the red herring of Iraq. For Sibel, it was time to strike back. She set up the first national security whistleblower network. Good afternoon, my name is Sibel Edmonds, and today we are having this press conference here as National Security Whistleblowers Coalition. Once you start hearing these names, it's going to become more real to you, the concept of national security whistleblowers and who these people are. Edward Costello, former special agent, counterintelligence, FBI. John M. Paul former veteran intelligence operations specialist, FBI. You know, when you're gonna hear people like 20 years of experience, have gotten this many medals, this many awards, patriotic, highly awarded, competent people, and they're being reduced to nothing. Steve Elson, veteran agent, FAA. John Vincent, veteran special agent, counterterrorism, FBI. We were compelled to go public only because the FBI wouldn't listen to us. If nothing happens, there will never be another FBI agent to come forward. And who will suffer when this happens? We all will. Matthew Fogg, Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal, INA. Until Congress takes a proactive role to make sure that if anything happens to you, that it will be brought to front. That's what this whistleblower network is about. It's saying enough is enough. Thank you very much. Senators have tremendous power. They can say, we are going to have an open public hearing. We bring in Sibel Edmonds, we bring in those people involved, we put them under oath during the public hearings and we have them testify. Dan Ellsberg, former special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Defense, DOD. Every federal employee shall put loyalty to country above loyalty to person, party, or government agency. I mean, what happens when you hear scandals after scandals about the FBI? Seeing these whistleblowers and seeing the number increasing exponentially, you're saying, this is time, and we're going to let the public decide. In the audience was a British journalist, David Rose, who'd been following Sibel's story for months. Suburban's case is interesting from several points of view, but the overriding factor is that nothing of what she came across at the FBI can really be aired. Now, this, this is bad from both points of view. If Sibel Edmonds was making it all up and was a fantasist, the state secret's privilege means that people she's wrongly accused have no way of proving that they're entirely innocent of the allegations that she has made and continues to make against them. But if she's telling the truth, then the American public, it being... Uh, kept in the dark about matters which I think probably most people in America will be actually keen to know about. Manhattan. On the 15th floor of a tower block overlooking the East River is the headquarters of the American Civil Liberties Union. It agreed to represent Sibel. Sibel had lost her case against the FBI because of state secrets privilege. For her appeal, she would be represented by Anne Beeson and Ben Wisner. It's really phenomenal to me that any court could look at her case and say, no, it can't go forward, no, she can't proceed or win her claim. What you have here is the Attorney General of the United States saying, the plaintiff can't even set foot inside a court because the entire case is a state secret. The defendant is the Justice Department, it's the FBI that committed the wrongdoing, and it's the Justice Department's own internal oversight body that has concluded that our client should win. 
and that cannot be. Not in a democracy. No, it can't be. In January 2005, Sibel and her lawyers won partial declassification of the Justice Department's internal report into her case. The report partially endorsed her claims. While it did not disclose the content of the FBI's wiretaps, for Sibel, it still represented a victory. It upheld her credibility. Anne Beeson and Ben Wisner prepared Sibel for her appeal. Very exciting week next week. <laughs> Are you prepared? It's like countdown. Oh. Also in 2005, Sibel's name was mentioned for the first time in a book. Paul Sperry, a journalist, had investigated Islamist networks in the United States. He took a new look at Sibel's case. Sperry was the first to name the organization on whose behalf the Dickersons had tried to recruit Sibel. It was a Washington-based lobby group, the American Turkish Council, or ATC. The chairman of the American Turkish Council. Are we ready to run that? And we'll uh, serve the same The time. ATC's offices are on 14th Street in Washington, D.C. It holds its annual conference across town in the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. Turkey. This is modern Turkey. The aim of the ATC is to promote business between Turkey and the United States. Geographically, connecting Asia to Europe and the Middle East to Africa strengthens Turkey as a center of intercontinental information, technology, communications, and finance. America is honored to call Turkey an ally. Turkey's role as an energy corridor for oil and natural gas and the country's cultural connections increase Turkey's power in the region. At the conference, oil magnates and defense contractors rub shoulders with Turkish and American soldiers and diplomats. We have a very well working strategic partnership. This is a very strong relationship. One does need to look at the uh, close connections that exist between the United States and Turkey and the important place that Turkey occupies in US foreign policy in several respects as a customer for armament systems and of course you look at the people who are on the board of the American Turkish Council and it's a it's a, almost like a who's who of some of the big American weapons corporations Boeing General Dynamics Lockheed Martin Northrop Grumman Raytheon United Technologies BAE Systems. Seven of the world's leading arms corporations sit on the ATC board. Their annual turnover is $220 billion, equivalent to almost half the military budget of the United States, or all of Europe's put together. And Turkey is a prized customer. Trade is a key part of this. Here, Turkish officers and diplomats use their influence on their Washington friends to finesse sensitive security issues. Although 80% of the Turkish arsenal is American-made, the Turkish military resents the fact that some weapon systems are denied them. The FBI, aware of this, began wiretapping the ATC in 1997. The FBI employed Melik Dickerson without knowing that she had worked for the ATC. Clearly, she was still doing so when she tried to recruit Sibel. But what was so compromising about the wiretap conversations that Sibel had been working on? The people that I've talked to about these tapes are extremely nervous. The 23rd of April, 2005, the day of Sibel's appeal. She and her lawyers cited the First Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees freedom of speech. They sought to have state secrets privilege overturned once and for all. But the lawyers didn't even get the chance to plead her case. 
set of questions for each side. There was no argument. Yes, they excluded, they excluded us. Oh. Good morning, afternoon. What is it? <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Beeson. I'm the Associate Legal Director of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, as you all know, we just had an argument inside the courthouse in Sibel Edmonds' case against the Department of Justice. Um, the court did, as you all know, because you've been out here, uh, close the courtroom for the argument. We went in there. We had about, what, three, four minutes? And then we were kicked out. And they spent another 10, 12 minutes with the government attorneys. We don't know what they talked about, but we will be waiting for their decision. It's clear that it should go forward because the Justice Department's own inspector general concluded that her allegations were fully supported and that the FBI terminated her services because she made them. Look. When the Attorney General came initially and invoked the state secret privilege, okay, he cited two reasons, to protect certain sensitive diplomatic relations and to protect certain foreign business relations of the United States. Now, they are saying that whole information, everything is classified. We don't know what diplomatic relations they are referring to. They must be ashamed of it because they don't want to mention it. So we have certain diplomatic relations that prevents criminals being, you know, prosecuted here. And I'm talking about the criminals in the United States of America, American citizens. I'm not referring to only foreigners. That's your fight, too. As much as it is my fight, it's not only for whistleblowers. It's your fight, too. A few days after the hearing, the judgment was given. Sibel lost her appeal. Her lawyers now considered Sibel to be the most gagged citizen in American history. Only one avenue remained open to her, the Supreme Court. When Sibel began working for the FBI, she was 32. She was now 36. On the 3rd of August, 2005, Vanity Fair published David Rose's article. Sibel's story was splashed across the newsstands. I remember I wrote the pitch, the, the memo, suggesting the article like it was a film thing. So I said, act one, you know, there is Sibel, this brave Turkish-American, she wants to do the right thing. Then to a horror, she discovers some kind of spy. And then act two is the terrible things happen to her. She uh, gets fired and she gets victimized and so forth. And then act three is her fight back. And I said it ends with the article being published in Vanity Fair and then suddenly she gets a ticker tape parade through New York and everyone thinks she's a national hero. Of course, that bit hasn't happened yet. What Sibel told congressional investigators was that there had been investigations into Turkish targets. Uh, some of these Turkish targets were supposed to, to be government officials, diplomats working in the embassy or in the con consulate in Chicago, and some were uh, non-governmental officials working for the ATC, the American Turkish Council. The of the ATC annual conference on U.S. As far as I am concerned, the article is replete with uh, noble lies and uh, responsible journalists would not have run with it. Uh, it says, uh, but the wiretap suggested to Sybil Edmonds that the Washington office of the ATC was being used as a front for criminal activity, and that we would deny in the absolute strongest possible terms. But there was a bigger bombshell than that. The article also revealed that Sibel had reported hearing Turkish wiretap targets boasting of a covert relationship with Dennis Hastert, the Republican Speaker of the House of Representatives. He denied it through a spokesman. This is all nonsense. It's not being reported by the mainstream press because there's no factual evidence. The reporter does not have a transcript of any wiretap conversations that we know of. And even if we did, it's preposterous. The speaker does not have any connections to American Turkish interests. Makes for a great summertime reading. And the next thing the magazine will do is blame the speaker for the Jennifer Aniston Brad Pitt breakup. In a country rocked by intelligence scandals ever since September 11th, 
the revelations in Vanity Fair didn't cause much of a stir. Sibel went on waiting for the Supreme Court decision. This article only deals with two angles, only two angles of much more. I'm not the only one who knows about this. Too many people know about this. The fraudulent 9-11 commissioners, every single one of them knows about my case and the details and the names and all the specifics. Several people within the United States Congress do know. Everybody in the FBI involved, they know. Everyone in Department of Justice, they know. My goal has been exposing the criminal activities. Criminal activities where money laundering, narcotic activities, and nuclear black market converge with terrorist activities. Put out the tapes, put out the wiretaps, put out those documents. Put out the truth. The truth is going to hurt them. The truth is going to set me free. Let's finish. Some people in influential positions in America do not want the full truth about Sabelle's case to come out. The sort of neocon clique that has had such an influential role in American foreign policy that was the driving force behind the war with Iraq, most notably, also have lots of close connections in Turkey. They're determined to do whatever they can to preserve Turkey as an ally of the United States. Neoconservatives, Ankara's allies in Washington and the Pentagon, were then influential in the Bush administration. Allies of Vice President Dick Cheney, they were ideologues who advocated high military spending and a hardline foreign policy. They made their debut in the Reagan administration in the 1980s. Under Bill Clinton, the most influential among them took positions with leading defense contractors. Back in power under George W. Bush, they were also very close to the Israeli right. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Welcome. Seven thousand kilometers from Washington, another man has inside information. Ex-CIA officer Philip Giraldi, formerly based in Turkey, is retired and living in Tuscany. He has a disturbing take on the case of Sibel Edmonds. Around about a year ago, I realized that I understood what the full story was and what she was trying to say. Uh, although she couldn't do it publicly because of the gag order. For me, the full story was uh, to follow the money on this. Giraldi wrote a column about Sabelle's case in the American Conservative magazine. He reviewed the activities of the American Turkish Council and other Turkish and Israeli lobby groups, their financial links with the Turkish authorities, and their links with what he called the military-industrial complex Neocon Network. Turkey is interested in being able to purchase embargo technologies and that sort of thing that you'd like to get. And knowing the players in the game from my time in the Central Intelligence Agency, I assumed that the Turks and the Israelis and these people, most of whom came out of the Department of Defense, would have been dealing in, in weapons. In recruiting Israel's top supporters in the United States, the Turkish generals knew what they were doing. Over 10 years, Turkey received more than $12 billion worth of military assistance from the US. A grateful Ankara opened its airspace to Israel. The Anatolian plateau, bordering both Syria and Iran, was a godsend for Israel. By the mid-90s, the triangle of the United States, Israel, and Turkey had entered its golden age. Giraldi identifies two figures of the neoconservative right as typical of the American allies of Turkey and Israel. The charismatic Richard Pearl, nicknamed the Prince of Darkness, and his protege, Douglas Fife, a fervent supporter of Israeli settlers in the West Bank and Gaza, both were former Pentagon officials, and both played a pivotal part in the U.S.-Turkish-Israeli triangle. Douglas Feith was a paid consultant for the government of Turkey, 
in the late 1980s and into the early 1990s, and Richard Pearl was working as one of his consultants also on the Turkish project. Both of these individuals are closely tied to defense industries in Israel. Richard Pearl is very well known to the intelligence community, and I would suspect that most people in the intelligence community who know about him and his story would say that basically he's an agent of influence for the state of Israel. Richard Pearl was first investigated for his links with Israel in 1970. He was wiretapped by the FBI. It is said that in 1983, Fife lost his position on the National Security Council for disclosing secret information to Israel. In 1986, 88 and 98, their closest associates were investigated over similar allegations. The latest scandal broke in 2005 when confidential documents on Iran's nuclear program were illegally passed from the Pentagon to the Israeli embassy. Once again, Fife was in the firing line. Mr. Amshaker, did anyone in your office give classified documents to Israel or Ahmed Shalabi? No. I mean, not, not, I'm, I'm, as you know, that's a matter that's being investigated. I don't know of that, but uh, it's a matter that's under investigation. Did, did they, All of these people have been investigated by the FBI at one point or another for passing secret information to Israel. In no cases were any of them convicted because the prosecutions were dropped, uh, in my opinion, because of political pressure not to get into this kind of case that involves Israel and espionage. To avoid suspicion, Israel and Turkey both used a tried and true method, the front company. One was Giza Technologies, a New Jersey import-export company. Its manager, Zeki Bilman, is Turkish. His conversations monitored by the FBI were translated by Sibel Edmonds. In 2003, Giza Technologies shipped 200 triggered spark gaps, devices that could be used to detonate nuclear weapons to an Israeli broker in Cape Town. Their export, like that of enriched uranium, was restricted to signatories of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, such as South Africa. If you want to circumvent the system, what you do is you sell the weapon to a country that is entitled to buy it, and that country, acting collusively with you, uh, will forge or alter the end-user certificate so the weapon actually winds up somewhere else. From Cape Town, Giza's detonators were sent straight to Pakistan. Six months later, the Israeli broker was arrested. There was an inquiry, but Giza was never investigated. That was a mistake, says journalist Joseph Trento. Why wasn't Giza exposed? Well, the answer is Giza wasn't exposed because it may have been used for other operations in the past. It may have been a front for the U.S. intelligence service, most likely Israeli intelligence from the description of the people involved. While the United States and Turkey has had a very close relationship, there's no closer relationship than the United States and Israel. Now, why would the Israelis help the Pakistanis get parts for a bomb? Well, the only way they would do that is if the United States requested it. On the outskirts of Islamabad, the recipient of Giza's detonators is now under house arrest. His name is Abdul Qadir Khan. A metallurgical engineer trained in the Netherlands, he was the father of Pakistan's nuclear program. It was launched in the late 1970s with the aim of matching India, which already had the nuclear bomb. Companies in Turkey have, have um, helped Pakistan's nuclear weapons program since almost the beginning of, of Khan's effort. David Albright is an international expert on nuclear proliferation. He knows the dark side of Pakistan's nuclear arms race and the role Turkey plays in the nuclear black market.
Turkey's a NATO member. It's close to Europe. Uh, there are many exports to Turkey um, that receive very little scrutiny. And, and yet those exports were then transferred on to Pakistan. And so, um, and one of the things that has been very frustrating is, is that the United States government knew about these kinds of, uh, of uh, antics early on. In 1998, Pakistan carried out its first nuclear test. Abdul Qadir Khan became a national hero as the father of the Pakistani bomb. Or, as fundamentalists called it, the Islamic bomb. It's quid pro quo. Remember, the goal in the 1980s was to defeat the Soviet Union and use Pakistan as an aid to Afghanistan in making that happen. And the Reagan administration gave Pakistan anything it wanted. In early 2004, a huge international police operation uncovered the AQ Khan network, the most extensive nuclear proliferation network in history. Khan's principal associates, among them a number of Turkish businessmen, were arrested. AQ Khan has confessed his crimes, and his top associates are out of business. But Khan did not disclose all his secrets. Pakistan categorically refused to allow the Americans to interrogate Khan. I think it's fair to point out that the Khan network is still operating. It's not been shut down. The Pakistanis have not been shut down. And top Pakistani officials, generals, public servants, etc., have been rewarded because of this activity. And the United States has done nothing. There's concern that uh, some kind of transfer happened to al-Qaeda back when uh, the Taliban were in control of Afghanistan. It's, uh, it's more speculation, but there's still worry that some people associated with Khan or the Pakistani nuclear weapons program provided some kind of assistance to, to al-Qaeda. For over 20 years, another woman had been on the trail of the nuclear black market. Her quest took her from Pakistan to Turkey along the old Silk Road, now a trade route for oil, gas, weapons and heroin. Her identity should never have been made public. But in July 2003, leaks from the White House led to the publication of her name and of the organization she worked for. Her name is Valerie Plain, and she worked for the CIA's counter-proliferation division. The Plain affair soon grew into a scandal, Revealing an agent's identity is a federal crime. Who would dare to do it? I and my former CIA colleagues trusted our government to protect us as we did our jobs. That a few reckless individuals within the current administration betrayed that trust has been a grave disappointment to every patriotic American. The media interpreted the leak as retaliation against Valerie Plame's husband, Ambassador Joseph Wilson, who had queried George W. Bush's claims about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The name of the company Valerie Plame used as a front was also disclosed. She worked for a company called Brewster Jennings, and that Brewster Jennings apparently was working against the target of Turkey meaning that Turkey was being investigated by the CIA as a proliferator of weapons. The media failed to notice the disturbing similarities between the Plame and Edmonds cases. Like Sibel, Valerie Plame worked in the area of nuclear trafficking. And like Sibel, her investigations foundered when she approached the Black Sea region. The name Valerie Plame, I was not familiar with that name until it became public. But uh, if someone were to ask me about Brewster Jennings, uh, Jennings, that would be a different uh, question and it would be a different uh, story, but a story that I could not comment on because, as you know, I cannot talk about the targets of investigations or issues, details that I dealt with during my work with the FBI. What Sibel could not say was published in the Turkish newspaper Hurriyet in November 2005. 
One of Valerie Plame's and Brewster Jennings' targets was the American Turkish Council. The Plame and Edmonds cases are part of the same story. That same month, the Supreme Court decided not to review the lower court decisions on Sabel's case. But Sabel's fate had in fact been sealed three years before, at a high-level meeting in Washington. The state secret privilege was invoked not by the FBI, but by the Pentagon and the State Department. They requested that that uh, Sybil Edmonds not be able to speak on this issue. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about Edmonds, and I'm sorry about Plame. I'm sorry about all these people, but I can name hundreds of others who tried to stop things like this and seen it before. And this is a repeat. The difference is the Bush crowd plays rougher than any of them. Penn American Center is pleased to present Sibel Edmonds with the 2006 Penn Newman's Own First Amendment Award. Sibel may have lost her fight against the United States government. But in April 2006, recognition came to her via Penn the prestigious International Writers and Journalists Association, whose members aim to defend freedom of speech. Today, we are facing despots who use national security and classification to push everything under a blanket of secrecy, to gag and call it a privilege. Unless we recognize these attacks for what they are and stand up and speak out, no, shout out against those despots in government, then we are doomed to wake up one sad morning and wonder when and where our freedom died. Thank you. <laughs> 